we don't sugarcoat what happens here. Animals live, animals die. They get hurt, some of them we save, some of them we don't. And we share the true stories. We want people to understand that human decisions have real consequences. Let's see, we've taken in, early this morning they took in a white-tailed deer and a crow, um, but that was before we opened. Um, and so we've just been getting a lot of calls. We had a call about owls nesting. Wildlife Center um, Virginia, this is Audrey, may I help you? Okay, that sounds good. Uh, could you bring them to us? We're here nine to five every day. We'd be happy to see what we could do for them. Back in 1982, uh, the Wildlife Center of Virginia was started as a local wildlife rehabilitation center. We really intended to simply take animals from our own community that were injured or needed help, help them get well and go back to the wild. And of now, 35 years later, uh, the Wildlife Center of Virginia is one of the leading wildlife hospitals in the entire world. Uh, we train students from every vet school in the U.S. and Canada, and both students and professionals, from more than 40 other countries that come here to our facilities in Waynesboro, Virginia, to learn to apply the very general skills of veterinary medicine to the very specialized world of conservation and wildlife medicine. We have one bald eagle in that uh, came in a couple weeks ago with a humerus fracture. Um, and so that bird was treated this morning, um, as was a vulture, um, as was uh, several songbirds. You know, this is the time of year we're getting in a lot of songbirds, a lot of small rabbits. Um, and then, let's see, our, the patients that we've gotten in today, uh, we've gotten in a small blue jay that was attacked by a cat, um, a bunny. Um, a deer fawn, a turtle. So already, you know, our day's been pretty busy. Um, yeah, I think that's about it <laughs> so far. Just because he's half Little thing uh, was at my basement doorstep. Mm -hmm. And it's alive and it looks oh. healthy. You know, it's a little rabbit. Yeah, it's a baby rabbit. Mm -hmm. And so there's nothing there. And yeah. I mean, can you guys take it and. Yeah, so um, I'll put him in the ICU, which is just an incubator. Usually they go into a waiting room, but uh -huh. since he's a pinky, um, that's what we call it with eyes closed. Yeah. Um, he'll go into an incubator and just get a little bit warmer. But yeah. We'll so how him. old do you think he is? Oh, he's new, like a couple of days. Yeah. I was going around the back of my house to spray for weeds, and it's just a cement slab. And I happened to look up, and there was this that little precious baby was there, and I thought. First I thought it wasn't alive and then I, I touched it with my foot just real gentle and it moved and so I didn't touch it anymore. I just went in and got the uh, cloth and put over it and immediately brought it here. Where my house is there's no shelter for it so it would have, you know, a, a hawk or something would have came down and it would have been history so I'm so grateful. We uh, are known as a trauma center for wildlife. Most people are aware that uh, if you find an injured animal in our community, you bring it to the Wildlife Center. But that's sort of the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we, we certainly are overwhelmed with wildlife during the spring of the year in the month of May. Uh, of this year, we received over 500 wild animals. Uh, that's a new patient coming in at the rate of one every 29 minutes during business hours, seven days a week. And uh, that's, that's a pretty big uh, burden right there. But the challenge is really one of public behavior more than anything else. The overwhelming cause of injuries to our patients are, are humans, men, women, children, and their pets, and then close behind the, the way they manage and interact with the environment. So if we could get people to just think that instant before they act, before they throw that item out the window, before they let the cat out the back door without giving it a thought, to just think about the impact on wildlife of that simple human decision, we could reduce the impact on wildlife by 90%.
some of the biggest challenges we face are probably still getting word out there to people and making sure people are in the know with some of the issues going on. I think we do a great job with reaching people all around the world every year, but uh, it's still a lot of people don't know some of the very simple actions that they take day to day can really make a big difference in the lives of wild animals. So I think the constant challenge is always doing more and reaching more and, uh, and getting it all done in a day because I know it's, uh, it's a busy place that keeps us hopping. Certainly one of the greatest success stories in the protection and restoration of endangered species is the bald eagle, our national symbol. Uh, we chose the bald eagle to be the symbol of the United States back in 1782. Uh, they were found all over North America, but then we set out to shoot them, trap them, poison them, destroy their homes, and drive them quite literally to the brink of extinction. And here in Virginia, it was no exception. Uh, as recently as uh, the early 70s, we had fewer than 30 nesting pairs of bald eagles in our whole state when the population was at one time uh, estimated to be over 10,000 birds. But through the Endangered Species Act, through the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, and strict law enforcement at both the state and national level, and more importantly, the support of the public, we brought this population back from the brink. Today in Virginia, we have uh, well over a thousand nesting pairs of bald eagles in the state. Uh, their population has expanded so much that they're now living in parts of Virginia that they were never even traditionally found. brought them back from the devastation of DDT and deliberate killing that uh, pushed them to the brink of extinction, but now we've got new problems, new environmental threats. Uh, they don't have big bodies of water in the western part of the state in which they can fish, and so they're having to eat roadkill. They scavenge for food, they visit landfills, and they're picking up all sorts of things that they just shouldn't be eating. And one of the biggest problems we're having now is uh, lead poisoning in bald eagles because they're scavenging animals that have been left in the field by hunters. And the uh, ingestion of a piece of lead the size of a grain of rice is enough to kill a bald eagle in 72 hours. So when we get them here at the Wildlife Center, one of the first things we do is check their blood lead level. And indeed, uh, more than 60% of the bald eagles we are receiving in our hospital today have dangerously high levels of lead in their blood, and it kills an awful lot of them. So while we have brought them back from the brink of extinction and the population is expanding, we still must be vigilant to be sure that that population does not go into decline again and we can retain this conservation success story. Okay, so this is a box turtle. Um, he's been with us since 2016. Um, so we overwinter them uh, through the cold weather so they can be released in the springtime. Um, so he's going outside to acclimate right now, which means I'll take him up to the turtle yards and he'll get to hang out outside for the day. Um, this is his meal. And then at night we bring him back inside and he goes back in his box. Um, and then after a certain period of time acclimating, they get to live out in the turtle yards and then eventually they get to be released. is apparently very hungry. Uh, for the most part, they, people tend to think they eat vegetation, uh, which they do, but pretty much whatever they can find that they think tastes good, they will eat. So we give them a rotating diet, so every day of the week, they get their turtle bulk, which is veggies, and they get fruit, and then they get something different. So today they get mice, sometimes they get tomatoes. We're getting patients in um, you know, just by the you know, 10, 20, 30 patients in a day. And um, a lot of those patients, you know, some of them come to us after uh, very traumatic injuries. And so sometimes that's hard to see. Some days are, are really hard. Um, some days, most 
or even all of the patients that we receive um, either don't make it or we have to make that hard decision to euthanize them, um, but still the support that we give each other. And then, um, then those, those release stories, um, you know, that's what we strive for. And whenever an animal comes in that's injured, we repair them. Our rehab team does a great job rehabilitating that animal and then we're able to release it. Those are the, those are the stories, those are the patients that, that we live for. Those are the ones that keep us coming back. What's going on with the possum here? Yeah, she was um, she was trapped. I kind of think that um, I think that the citizen that trapped her was trying to trap something else, and then um, this girl got in the trap instead. Uh, but she did have some wounds on her back and near her tail, and then she had several broken ribs. Um, but she also has a lot of babies in her pouch. So, um, you know, we've been treating her and cleaning her wounds, and then we were just rechecking her rib fractures to make sure that everything was going okay. Um, but otherwise, she's been doing fine, getting a lot of weight. <laughs> How long has she been here? Um, maybe a little over a week. Um, let's see, she was here. I'm 27th now. Oh, yeah, she was admitted on June 27th up here you can kind of see she's got some uh, fracture lines of some of her ribs you can see it a little more easily on this view um, so all these ribs are pretty normal over here um, and then these ribs she's got a couple that are fractured right in the middle so it could have happened um, from a predator you know if she was attacked by a dog or, or something else um, she could have gotten hit by a car you know we have no idea we rarely know what actually happens to them <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's kind of what gets you through every single day is knowing um, that chance that you can help that animal and you can get them back out in the wild and they want to be wild. Um, so that's, that's our, the biggest um, reason, you know, for, <laughs> I guess, being here every day. Well, one of the things that uh, we can easily point to in terms of how the changing environment has changed the world for wildlife is looking at the, the ruby-throated hummingbird. Uh, while we would occasionally see one uh, after the 1st of October when we started this organization back in the 1980s, today it's very common to see them all the way up into November in places that at one time would have been just plain too cold for them. And now we're seeing them come back before their uh, seasonal norms. So the, the migration pattern has extended simply because the, the climate has changed enough and it's warmed. For white-tailed deer, the, the warming climate has extended the breeding season. When we first started the Wildlife Center of Virginia back in 1982, if people ask us when are white-tailed deer fawns born, we would say just automatically from the middle of June until the middle of July. And 99% would have been born during that basically one month period. Today, because winters are much milder and start later and the growing seasons have changed, uh, we're now finding deer fawns, new deer fawns on the ground at the end of April and new deer fawns being born well into September. So it's, it's really quite alarming and it certainly is changing the survival rate. It's changing the population dynamic uh, of, of this particular species. But it's just tangible proof that uh, we are affecting natural patterns. And we're doing so at a rate that is unnatural. I think probably the very most simple thing that is very important for people to remember is really every day very simple actions really can make a difference. I know it can be really overwhelming sometimes to think about, you know, how do I help wildlife and the environment. I'm just one person. Uh, but by knowing how to get help, of knowing how to help that turtle cross the road, or knowing and sharing that information of not releasing balloons into the environment, or sharing information on why it's not good to use lead-based ammunition when hunting. Uh, all of those things really add up and certainly make a difference uh, to the animals that are around us. I like to use the example of being on an airplane. If you were flying along at 30,000 feet and you saw little parts of the plane coming off, well, it might be a rivet here or a screw there or a pipe there or a wire at the other end of the plane, and maybe individually they don't really matter to the integrity of that aircraft and the safety of its passengers, but at some point, one too many pieces is going to fall off and the plane will no longer function properly. And it's very similar to our 
indifference as a society to the loss of species, the loss of ecosystems, and the loss of the integrity of the balance of nature. Um, so did the dog get this one? No. Okay. No, just um, the mom as a Okay. The I'll take it back and weigh it. Rabbits that are over a certain weight can. Um, that was my question. Yeah. Survivors yeah. And... Um, his okay. ears picked up like that is a good sign. That means he um, should be old enough to be on his own. But we'll weigh it just to make sure. Excellent. Yeah. Thank and you. Um, don't I wouldn't fill out any paperwork, and I'll check and see. Hopefully, he can okay. go back out. Thank you. You're welcome. Little baby rabbit. There's probably more, but the mama was unfortunately killed by a dog, so we are going to see what we can do with the little guy. So we not only want to know what's wrong with this patient, we want to know why was it injured, why was it poisoned, what are the environmental factors that led to this animal coming in. And today we are working with our colleagues nationwide, we're working with state and federal agencies uh, on issues like emerging disease surveillance and invasive species, looking at the, the animals, the plants, the insects, and indeed the pathogens, the germs that are now part of our ecosystem that don't belong here. Uh, the Zika virus is a perfect example of a South American virus that has profound implications for humans that is now being spread across the United States, or at least in certain regions in the United States, by the Asian uh, tiger mosquito, which is itself an invasive species. And it's a species that is breeding in tire dumps where people have just discarded solid waste in an irresponsible way. And it ultimately gets back to the integrity of the environment. And when we create these landfills, we create an environmental problem. And that problem will manifest itself not only in aesthetic ways, because it looks bad, but because it is a breeding ground for invasive animals, for disease, vector species. And when those species really uh, explode, then they take with them pathogens uh, and human threats that can have profound consequences. We really have one world, one health. Environmental health, animal health, and human health are completely inseparable. I've had a few bear calls um, about bears in the neighborhood and they want them to be picked up and relocated, which we can't do. And the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries are the ones that, if a bear is injured, picks up and brings to our facility. Um, and so people get frustrated thinking that we just are going to, like one citizen said, let them attack children, um, which bears don't do normally. Um, so that I've had a few phone calls, especially around Fourth of July, because the bears are smart. They're going to go to all of the the grills and everything like that. So just being um, bear aware and having bear smart community helps. But uh, there, I mean, it ranges from frantic people trying to do the best thing to um, people who are, you know, really emotional about emotional about saving um, an animal's life. So.
I think working in this setting, working in a wildlife hospital, has made me more aware of the things that I do that impact wildlife, and it's made me more aware of how other people aren't aware of it. Um, someone might not realize something that they're doing that's having a negative impact on wildlife. One of my favorite stories is the story of Ruby, our red-tailed hawk. She was hit by a car and she suffered injuries to her wings and her eye, and she lost her eye and had to be surgically removed. And um, I like that story because it reminds people how dangerous roadside litter is. If you are eating an apple, you throw the core out your car window, it lands on the side of the road, um, that's going to attract wild animals. It's going to attract mice, squirrels, um, and in turn that attracts predators, larger animals, birds of prey, hawks, owls. And that's likely what happened with Ruby. about face here so I'm going to basically I'm going to launch her straight down this greenway right here so everybody can get an opportunity to see her fly right by you and we're going to traditionally we're going to count down from three so it's going to be three two one and then throw so if you uh, want to get your cameras ready at that point um, she'll probably go up she'll probably rouse her feathers out a little bit just to get herself uh, repositioned and she may land in a nearby tree. She may also circle around completely, give us the, uh, the old stink eye and, um, and then be on her way. So we'll see what happens, but um, best of luck, girl. All right, are we ready? One, two, three. Well, here in Virginia, we have um, a beautiful state, a very diverse state. But we also have some very large urban areas in the state that are encroaching on the natural areas of the state. Uh, and we're seeing oftentimes a conflict between people who have grown up without exposure to nature, who want to move out into the natural world, but they want to treat wildlife as if it comes out of a catalog, Oh yes, I want the pretty songbirds. No, I don't want the skunk digging up the front yard. No, I don't want the black bear knocking over the trash can. And somehow they think that that's an okay thought process, that they can say, yes, I want these, no, I don't want those, and somebody will do something about it. And that's part of the nature deficit syndrome, as it's often been characterized, where people just don't understand. If you move into a natural world, there are things that live there first. And just because your name's on the deed, it's their home too. And uh, that whole process of the interface between natural Virginia and urban Virginia has been a real challenge. Um, we also are finding that things that happen in other states affect us and they're outside of our control. Uh, our air pollution uh, for many, many years, the acidification of our mountain streams was from pollution coming from the Ohio River Valley, not generated here in Virginia. We couldn't pass a state law that said power plants in the Ohio River Valley had to stop polluting our streams, but our streams were polluted. We lost our native species. Uh, chronic wasting disease is a, a, a form of uh, brain disease as a spongiform encephalopathy that similar to mad cow disease now in Virginia and it's in Virginia because our neighboring state of West Virginia allowed deer farming and allowed people to bring in deer from other states where the disease occurred and inevitably that disease escaped those captive deer operations across the state border and now we're dealing with it in Virginia so being a part of a bigger ecosystem is sometimes challenging when that ecosystem extends beyond the boundaries of the state. I 
think uh, the Wildlife Center is always interesting and always exciting, so I look forward to seeing where we go in the future. I think uh, it's nothing but good things. I look forward to us embracing more use of technology and being able to share our information and educational lessons and things that happen here every day at the center. I look forward to sharing that with more and more people all around the world.